my name is Tanisha Martin, and I'm the founder and executive director of Black Girls Hack, a nonprofit that was set up to help educate underrepresented communities in STEM, cybersecurity, and ethical hacking. The Black Girls Hack community is open to everyone, but focuses on the issues affecting Black girls and women in the areas of cybersecurity. I am a penetration tester and adjunct professor of computer science and cybersecurity with a background in the business of healthcare and cybersecurity. When I heard that Blacks in Cybersecurity Village was focusing on a theme of social justice issues within technology, I hopped on my soapbox and submitted my abstract. I called it how bias and discrimination in artificial intelligence will have Black folks incarcerated or dead. I hadn't completed the talk yet or even done extensive research, but I knew that one of the issues that drove me to start Black Girls Hack and to develop services like the Black Kids Hack program was the need to increase diversity in cybersecurity by attracting talent at earlier phases of their lives. In computer science and cybersecurity, we often refer to this as shifting left. It's the concept that defects and vulnerabilities in software are cheaper and quicker to address when they are found earlier in the software development lifecycle. For the issue of a lack of diversity in cybersecurity, this translates into getting people interested in the field earlier in life. My solution to this problem is to create programs which provide exposure to Black children and let them know the options in science, technology, engineering, and math, and in particular, to the options in cybersecurity. As I've been trying to get the Black Kids Hack program off the ground, one of the primary questions I've been preparing for is the impact the exposure will make. To explain this, I often point to the areas of algorithm development, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and the impact the lack of diversity has on people's lives in the areas of healthcare and criminal justice reform. To truly make an impact in these areas, we need to get kids involved early so that the field gets the benefits that exposure in STEM brings to collaboration, communication, research, and exploration. Artificial intelligence is defined by the Food and Drug Administration as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It defines machine learning as an artificial intelligence technique that can be used to, to design and train software algorithms to learn from and to act on data. Software developers use machine learning to create algorithms that are adaptive so that their behavior can change over time based on new data. The algorithms review the data that is provided and then adapt the outcomes based on the lesson it learns from the data that it has reviewed. This analysis is then used to help predict outcomes based on the expectation that historical data can be used as a predictor of future patterns. In the past 10 years, and as a result of improvements in hardware, algorithmic development, and machine learning, AI has shown great promise in everything from determining which doctors go into which specialty, detecting eye and skin conditions, evaluating human behaviors associated with psychiatric conditions, and determining whether a person having abnormal rhythm needs to be shocked or not. Artificial intelligence has long held the hopes and dreams of cybersecurity to improve not only healthcare, but also criminal justice outcomes. It has historically been acknowledged that personal human bias has led to discrepancies in sentencing for people of color, specifically black men and in healthcare outcomes. Think about mortality rate for birthing for black women. So what is at stake here is literally a life or death situation. Life in jail incarcerated for people of color and poor, poor health outcomes for, or death when it comes to healthcare decisions. Artificial intelligence holds great promise for improved healthcare outcomes. It has been shown to help doctors analyze data and choose amongst different treatment options. Clinical decision support is integrated into electronic health, health record systems around the world and are used to establish things like best practice, medication guidelines, and prioritization of patients. It has also been used to implement systemic bias, for example, to identify programs for high-risk care programs that fail to refer minorities for advanced care. Think about this in terms of last-ditch medical trial programs where Black people fall outside of the specified range for inclusion. Ranges that have been shown to deliberately be adjusted for race in ways that hurt Black people and people of color. This so-called race-adjusted medicine alters the algorithms according to race so that the results are different depending on the color of the person being treated. I saw this firsthand when my mother was going through kidney failure. Black people get race adjustments with kidney medicines and the health of the patients with chronic kidney disease is determined by race-adjusted formulas. 
Black people are almost four times more likely to suffer from kidney failure. And once they get to that stage, they spend months later waiting for a kidney transplant than white patients. Because modern artificial intelligence and machine language systems learn from the analysis of large volumes of complex data, the systems learn from that data and adapt their reasoning-based decisions. Deep learning allows the systems to recognize patterns independently and make predictions such as recognizing cancerous lesions. But as black people are, are often excluded from that data collection and analysis process, medical professionals have to adjust the algorithms and formulas based on what they assume to be true. So what does this mean for us? What is, what is the real impact here? Let's look at the impact of race corrections in clinical medicine. The American Heart Association, which provides guidelines for heart failure, considers things such as blood pressure, sodium, age, and heart rate, and adjusts based on whether you are black or non-black. We also see this in the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Short-Term Risk Calculator. Risk scoring for operative mortality, which is the mortality rate for operations and major complications, increased by as much as 20% if the patient is identified as black. In nephrology, which deals with the kidneys, the organ procurement and transplant network has a kidney donor risk that projects, produce, the organ procurement and transplant network has a kidney donor risk that predicts an increased risk of, of kidney failure if the donor is black. Race adjustments effectively reduce the pool of kidney donors as they suggest that black people can only get kidneys from other black people. We also see examples like this in obstetrics, oncology, and pulmonology. The race adjustments in some case lower the assigned risk of a black person having a condition, which discourages doctors from pursuing further evaluation, potentially delaying diagnosis and further interventions. The problem here lies in the data. Data can be aggregated from a wide variety of so sources, but its interpretation is often subject to a certain amount of bias. Data is one of the most important and most problematic ingredients for training artificial and machine learning algorithms. These systems are taught a worldview based on data that is represented. Because the data is often itself biased, such as not including Black people in the advanced healthcare trials, the data does not represent Black people. The systems that are used in both healthcare and criminal justice systems leverage, learn, and gather intelligence that is used for specific applications. The lack of representation in the data and also in the algorithm development shows results that do not consider nor account for people of color. Another example of systemic bias is the use of diagnostic tools for the diagnosis of melanoma or skin cancer. Studies have long shown that deep learning devices and the algorithms themselves have difficulty diagnosing lesions on people with darker skin types. What this does is increases the time to diagnosis for people of color. The purpose of using technology is to help reduce health disparities, not to ex exacerbate them. Algorithms that are trained with data does not represent the pop whole population perform worse than for those underrepresented groups. We see this in action with algorithms trained with gender imbalance data that do worse at reading x-rays for the underrepresented gender. Additional evidence can be found with regards to skin cancer detection algorithms, which are trained primarily on light-skinned individuals. These algorithms do worse at detecting skin cancer affecting darker skin. But it's not just the algorithms. The doctors which are providing the instruction for the algorithms are also trained primarily on light-skinned individuals. Meet Malone McQuinde. Malone created the Mind the Gap, a handbook of images and descriptions of clinical signs and symptoms in black and brown skin. Before his handbook, a majority of medical students were only taught how to diagnose conditions on white patients. And it is this type of a conscious bias that makes it possible, makes the possible impact of these failures deadly. Given the life or death consequences, we see that bias in algorithm development and machine learning can have adverse effects when Black people are not included in the algorithm development and data collection processes. From a healthcare perspective, we can see that bias and discrimination in AI is a complex issue, one that not only requires more diversity in data, but also diversity amongst developers and tool makers. It is important that we continue analyzing the implicit bias in data and the use of data outputs that further perpetuate that bias. To address these issues, we have to shift our efforts left and expose more Blacks and people of color to careers in computer science, mathematics, and STEM. Getting more diversity in STEM fields will not only help to reduce the bias in analysis and design of algorithms, but will help a wealth 
of perspective and identifying built-in bias before it has the chance to affect the healthcare outcomes for an entire population of people. The discrimination and bias that we see in algorithms used in healthcare not only affect our health and well-being, but we also see some of the same problematic trends with regard to our basic freedoms. Studies have shown persistent racial dis disparities at every stage of the justice system and how judges are sometimes biased along racial lines in their sentencing. To help address human-based bias, whether intentional or not, the system has turned to the use of artificial intelligence, automated decision-making, or predictive analytics to help reduce these discrepancies. Law enforcement uses algorithms in the predictive analytics to pinpoint areas prone to criminal activity. A system like this is used in Chicago where they analyze social networks through publicly accessible data in order to forecast likely perpetrators of crime. Once an individual has been arrested, their likelihood of committing another crime is analyzed by an algorithm. Judges then use these tools to decide whether to incarcerate the person or to release them. Like all systems, algorithms are used to analyze data and learn based on the data that is given to it. If the data is biased, however, and shows, for example, black men being arrested at a higher rate, the algorithm is going to, is going to indicate them as being at a higher risk to not appear in court or to be rearrested. Risk assessment tools rely on historical data, data that is historically biased. The graphic here shows the cycle of how bias and discrimination is perpetuated. Data is collected and then that data connected that is, isn't analyzed. That analysis is then used to provide a prediction to police who then perform their intervention and their criminal response. Data is then collected based on the criminal response. We see that if the data is biased, we have a math-based model where the end result is that black people are targeted, arrested, and because of the algorithms, see them as a higher risk, they stay in jail. A 2018 article published by the ACU put it this way. Imagine a city where the city is made up of over 67% of black people, where 85% of the vehicle starts are blacks, 90% of citations are black, 95% of jaywalking is bl are black people, 94% of disobeying a police order cases are black, and 93% of the arrests are black. The developers of this algorithm are going to provide instructions that these statistics show that black people are at a greater risk of committing crimes. Now, what if we were to add to these figures that black people were two and a half more times likely to be stopped by the police than their white counterparts, or that the police department signaled out a city's black and Latino residents 83% of the time? These numbers are from Ferguson, Newark, and New York City, cities that use predictive analytics in their sentencing. Algorithms analyze this data and then conclude that the data reveals a very real consistent pattern of criminal behavior by people of color. This data and those algorithms are then provided to risk assessment tools, which the judges then use to determine whether to hold the individual or release them based on the risk. We see based on these statistics that the risk assessment will conclude that almost as a whole, Black people, particularly Black men, are, are a higher risk. This results in them being held without bail pending trial or incarcerated for longer. We also see the same issues with regards to skin color and facial recognition, facial recognition systems, which has implications in law enforcement surveillance, airport passenger screening, and comparison of mugshots and driver's licenses. The use of artificial intelligence in these applications is problematic because they are frequently used to convict people of color, despite the fact that the most popular facial recognition technologies have an error rate as much as 34% higher for certain classes of people, or more specifically for darker skinned women. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology has confirmed these studies and found that facial recognition technologies across 189 algorithms are least accurate on women of color. What this means is that when systems like these are used in the sentencing and conviction of black women, that there is a 34% chance that they are falsely being incarcerated. With no other population would error rates such as these be acceptable. So what does this look like for us? Meet Robert Williams. Robert was called in January, 2020 by the Detroit Police Department at his job. He was told to turn himself in for arrest. He thought it was a prank. An hour later, he was arrested in his home in front of his wife and daughters on a felony warrant. He was taken to a decision, detention center for a mugshot, fingerprints and DNA and was held overnight. They provided him with grainy surveillance photo which they said was him. He responded, do all black men look alike? 
He was eventually exonerated, but had to fight to have his records expunged. The process this took months. He is also considered to be the first known account of an American being wrongfully connect, uh, wrongfully convicted or wrongfully arrested based on facial recognition and algorithm. Like the issues we have seen in healthcare and in the lack of diversity in STEM, the solution here also lies in shifting left. We need criminal justice reform to address the fact that black people are more likely to be targeted by the police. We need data that is not a culmination of discrimination in our neighborhoods, and we need more diversity in the development of algorithms and machine learning. Cases like Robert Williams and Zix, because the system in place in police departments have mainly been trained using images of white men. A lack of diversity in the images used to develop the underlying databases means that the systems are less reliable when it comes to black men. It is this for this, it is for this reason that in June of 2020, several major players in the facial recognition game announced that they were stopping or pausing the facial recognition offering for law enforcement use. So how do we fix these issues? How do we deal with the systemic bias that is literally built in? The first step is including data that is obtained from a diverse segment of the population. In healthcare, this means doing studies that include people of color without adjustments due to race. In criminal justice, we need to address the systemic bias that gives us statistics like the one we see in New York, Ferguson, and Newark. But more specifically with regards to bias and algorithms and machine learnings, to address these deficiencies, we need to drive more diversity, specifically black girls, to address the pipeline of bias in healthcare and criminal justice. We need to fix the systems, collect data that is not based on biased social infrastructures, and then fix the algorithms. Research indicates that children who are exposed to STEM early fare better in academics than those that are not. Research also indicates that teachers who are well equipped to teach STEM play a vital role in guiding children, children who often outperform students with less experienced teachers. Long-term studies have shown that when you integrate math and science learning by letting children explore their surroundings, the learning becomes more relevant. Children with this exposure have been shown in long-term studies to be more observant, inquisitive, and start asking questions and stimulating their sense of investigation. This stimulation has a leads to a natural curiosity, which questions things like, why am I more likely to stay sick longer? Or why do I not get selected to the medical school residency program I wanted? Or why Uncle Ray Ray got locked up? High quality and early STEM education will help shape their minds and beliefs and give them critical analytical skills, which they can then use to focus on collaboration, communication, research, and exploration. They take this exposure and, results, and it results in more research and development in areas such as algorithm design and development. We spark a fire that changes what predictive analytic and decision support looks like in the future. These changes result in better healthcare outcomes and less incarceration in the Black community, which will leave us alive and free.